Now, friends, we come to another judge. We come to this man, Gideon, and we have here God's call of this man, Gideon, here in the sixth chapter. And then in the seventh chapter, we're going to see how God mightily used him. He, to my judgment, is one of the most interesting of the judges. And I recognize that I'd be in the minority if I said he was the outstanding judge, when in reality, of course, I guess that he's not. Deborah, the woman judge, was really the outstanding one. But none of them are outstanding, to tell the truth. It was always something that made them unusual and odd, but not outstanding. All of these men, they had one thing in common. They were little men. They were marked by mediocrity, ordinary, odd. Each one had a glaring fault. He was insignificant, insufficient, and inadequate. And he had some aberration in his life. And they had these glaring faults, but not an outstanding man among them. And the fact of the matter is why there are certain things that we've noted already. We had first Othniel when the first apostasy came and they were conquered by Mesopotamia. Why, Othniel was the deliverer. Then you have the second apostasy and They were conquered by the Moabites and the Philistines, and they were delivered through Ehud and Shamgar, the judges raised up at that time. And the only claim these men had to becoming a judge, Othniel happened to be a nephew of Caleb, married his daughter. And if it hadn't been for that, you'd never have heard of him. Ehud was left-handed. He was a southpaw. And all Shamgar had was an ox goad. But he knew how to use it, and God used these men. And then we came to Deborah, and she was a woman. And I know that these women's rights group will resent this very much, but she was a woman, and women didn't move into a position like this at all. And now we come to the fourth apostasy. They're conquered by Midian, and now God raises up Gideon. And we've all heard of Gideon because of the Gideons today. And we'll see where they got their name and why and how. Now I'm beginning at chapter 6 at verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. In other words, the children of Israel went out and lived in caves and dens. And there's abundant evidence of that in that land even to this day. The fact that many of them lived in caves, especially at this particular time. Now, this is the same old story. Israel had sinned, and here the old hook starts moving. God had blessed them under Deborah, but now they sin, and God delivers them to Midian. And notice what happens, why they cry out for deliverance. And in verse 5, we are told that the Midianites came up against the children of Israel, and they came up because... Israel had a good crop that was coming along of grain and that type of thing and cattle. And so we read in verse 5, "...for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it." Now, the Midianites apparently needed grain, and feed stuff for their stock, for instance, camels, and also their cattle. And Israel, verse 6, was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Here they go again, whining and complaining. But God is gracious and good, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, 
I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. A prophet came and told them why they were in the condition that they were. But now they've cried out to God, and God in mercy now sends them another judge. Notice verse 11, There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth unto Joash the Abiezrite. And his son Gideon thrashed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And friends, may I say that Gideon is not introduced to us as a hero or an outstanding man. You know what he's doing? He's thrashing wheat by the wine press. Now, that is something for you to note. You see, in that day, they put the threshing floor up on top of the hill, right on the highest place in the field. And that's where they thrash grain, because they were dependent upon the wind, and they'd pitch the grain up. And when they did, the wind would blow the chaff away, and the good grain would fall down on the threshing floor. That's where they did their thrashing. But the wine press was never put on top of the hill. It was put at the bottom of the hill because it would be pretty silly, would it not, to take a wheelbarrow and take your grapes up to the top of the hill when you didn't need any wind for them. You just took them to the bottom of the hill, and the wine press was put down at the bottom of the hill. Now, notice that. This is important to see the threshing floors at the top of the hill, the wine press is at the bottom of the hill. Now, where is Gideon threshing the grain? At the wine press. He's at the bottom of the hill. Why is he at the bottom of the hill? Well, friends, the reason is obvious. If he's at the top of the hill, the Midianites would see him, come get his grain. And the second reason, which probably is the first reason, he was a coward. He was afraid to go to the top of the hill. And so he's down here at the bottom of the hill, and friends, there's no wind blowing down there. You'd have to go to the top of the hill. And here he is with the flail, and he's pitching the grain up in the air. No wind to blow the chaff away. And what happens? Well, all of it just comes down around his head and his neck. And if you know anything about that, straw gets in your clothes around your neck, and it's very uncomfortable. And this was, I'm sure, a very frustrating experience that Gideon was having. And there he was. But God was going to use this man, a coward, by the way. And we'll see why he used him, this kind of a man. And notice what he says. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And don't tell me, friends, there's not humor in the Bible. I was asked a question in a Bible class down in Santa Ana in Orange County a long time ago, and they wanted to know why I use so much humor. Well, I hope I do. And they said, you know, that there's a danger of it being irreverent, you know. Well, God has a wonderful sense of humor, friends. The Bible is a serious book. It's dealing with a race that's in sin, and it's concerning God's salvation and it reveals him as high and holy and lifted up. But you know, God has a sense of humor. And if you miss that in the Bible, why, well, you won't find the Bible interesting because there's a great deal of it. I think it's humorous to see this fellow Gideon down at the wine press pitching that grain up and have it come down all over it. And then to top it all, the angel of the Lord, and personally I think the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ and when he was here on this earth, he had a real sense of humor. And he said that day about, you know, the Pharisees, the religious rulers, they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. If you don't think that's funny, the next time you see a camel, look at it. Why, it has more projections on it than some of these space vehicles that are sent out with all sorts of rods and everything else sticking out on them. 
Well, I found out, and I got on one in Egypt. They even got horns. I never knew that one before. And they have the biggest Adam's apple in the world, have pads on the knees, great big hoofs, and they have some one hump, some two hump. They have one-cylinder camels, two-cylinder camels. And everywhere you look at them, there's a projection, you see. And you just have to have a sense of humor, friends, to recognize that God has a sense of humor. And here it is here. And of all things, the Lord Jesus said that. And here, I think it's the Lord Jesus. And he calls him, thou mighty man of valor, the biggest coward in the world. And he calls him that. He does it to encourage him, of course. But the point is, It was rather a humorous title to give this man. Will you notice what takes place? Let me read verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us. If you'll notice, the Lord said, The Lord is with thee, not with us, not with the nation at this time, because the nation is in apostasy. But Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, notice how pessimistic he is, and then how wrong that he is. He says, if the Lord be with us, he said, the Lord has forsaken us. But the truth of the matter is, they had forsaken the Lord. They asked the question, where are all those miracles our fathers told us of? And look at our condition today. Now, the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? This is the call and commission of this man. And God says, I'm calling you. And I'm of the opinion when the Lord appeared to him and said to him, O thou mighty man of valor. I think Gideon looked up at him and he said, he couldn't be talking to me. And he must have looked around him to see if there wasn't somebody else there, and there wasn't. And Gideon says, who? Me? You don't mean to say that I'm a mighty man of valor? And he had a real inferiority complex. And Gideon was skeptical. He was cynical. He's weak. And he's a coward. Now, the Lord commissions him. And this man, Gideon, just didn't believe that God could use him. Listen to him. Verse 15 now, and I'm in the sixth chapter of Judges, and I mustn't forget that either. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Now, he belonged to the tribe of Manasseh. They had the land north of Jerusalem. Manasseh was one of the sons of Joseph. But notice what he says here. My family is poor, and I'm the least in my father's house. In other words, he just couldn't believe that God could use him. He honestly felt he was the last man in Israel to be used of God. And you want to know something? He was right. Our problem today, friends, is most of us are too strong for God to use us. Most of us are too capable for God to use us. You notice God only uses weak men. That's exactly what he says. God uses weak men. And you find over in 1 Corinthians 1, listen to what we have here in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, Not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God chooses weak men. That's the reason he used all these judges. 
Not one of them was capable. Not one of them outstanding. Does that encourage you, friend? May I say to you, a great many of us today, we look at ourselves, and then we look at others, and they say, oh my, God couldn't use me. And a great many are staying on the sidelines today, and they ought to be out being used of God, because God can use them. And we find in verse 28, "...and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen." Yea, and things which are not, to bring to pass things that are. Now, why does God do that? That no flesh should glory in his presence? And friends, any Christian worker that's proud, there's something wrong with him. Because God does not use the flesh. Anything that this poor preacher does in the weakness of the flesh, and then boasts of it, May I say to you, God hates it, he despises it, he can't use it. God wants weak vessels, and that's the only kind that God will use. Moses, you remember, told the Lord at first that he thought he could deliver Israel. You remember, he went out and slew the Egyptian when he was beating his slave, and Moses thought he could deliver Israel then, but God trained him 40 years out on the desert He said he didn't think he could do it. God says, then you're just ready for it. I can use you. And you remember Elijah. We think of him as being very strong. Read the call of Elijah. He walked into the court of Ahab and Jezebel, that it'll not rain these years. But according to my word, he just walked out. Sounds pretty brave. But God put him out by a little brook, Kirith. And there that man saw that brook dry up. And he found out that his life was a dried up brook. And then he looked down in that empty flour barrel, but he could sing the doxology when he did. And God fed him and the widow's family out of that empty flour barrel. Why? Because God chooses weak things. And you remember Simon Peter said, Depart from me, Lord. He'd fail the Lord so many times. He says, Depart from me. Get somebody else you can depend on. Lord Jesus said, I'm going to use you. God uses weak things. He took a little baby in the bulrushes and a baby in Bethlehem over against Caesar Augustus. And then he called that man Saul of Tarsus, you remember. And he used him. And he brought him to the place where he saw that he was nothing. And someone has said that the very interesting thing is Nero's on the throne And Paul is the one that's being beheaded, and it looks like he's lost out. But you know, history is already handed in its decision. Men name their sons Paul, and they call their dogs Nero. Quite interesting, is it not? Will you notice this man here is called a god, and he is a pretty weak individual. And God says to him, you're going to be the one that's going to deliver. And now God begins to train this man. And the way that he trained him, he had to overcome the fear and develop courage and faith in the man to strengthen his feeble knees and to make him patient. Now, will you notice verse 23? The Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it's yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that's by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God." from the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him, and so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day that he did it by night. You see, he's a coward. He obeyed God, but he wouldn't do it in the daytime. He went out and did it at night, and no one was sure who did it. And they began to make inquiry. In verse 29, they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? When they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon the son of Joash hath done this. 
And so they were just about ready to take this man out and skin him alive, by the way. But now God's going to use him, and God delivers him. And he's beginning to train him now. And in verse 34, we're told, But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And Abiezer was gathered after him. And the blowing of the trumpet meant war. And the minute that he did it, you know what happened? He got cold feet again, and he's just about ready to back out. So God established here with Gideon the first dew line, by the way. We have a dew line up in the north. Well, here's a dew line here. And the dew line here was he put out a fleece, and it's to be dew on it. Then he put it out, and it's not to be dew on it. And this is the test that God made. How gracious God was to this man. Now, friends, we come here at verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said... Now, will you note Gideon's statement? The Spirit of God came upon him, and for a while he drew great courage, and he sent messengers, we're told, throughout all Manasseh, and also was gathered after him, and he sent messengers unto Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Now, you will recall that many of these did not support Deborah, but now they have come at the call of Gideon. And actually, as we shall see in a few moments, he had an army of 32,000. Very imposing and very impressive, even in view of the fact we're told the Midianites as to number were like grasshoppers on the side of the hill because they had come in there actually from everywhere. These Midianites and Amalekites, they were Bedouins of the desert. And they moved as disorganized nomads, raiding crops and supplies of others. And by sheer numbers, they had overwhelmed the inhabitants of Israel, and the tribe of Manasseh took to the hills. And this is the period in which Gideon now is raised up of God. And yet with this number, you think he'd be encouraged. But now he says, and expresses a doubt, if thou wilt save Israel. Well, what do you mean, if, Brother Gideon? Hasn't God already told you that that's what he's going to do? There's no ifs about it now. God says that this is exactly what I'll do. Now, he puts a test, and God follows through on it because of the weakness of this man. Verse 37, As thou hast said, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, And if the dew be on the fleece only, and if it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And this is the dew line that was first put up. And it was so, for he arose up early on the morning and thrust the fleece together, and he wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water." And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be not hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. He reverses it, you see. You would think that the other would be sufficient, but no, this man, he's a coward, friends. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and I was dew on all the ground. Now, the man is encouraged, of course, by this, and we find that he's not actually quite ready yet to go into battle. And you'll find out God's going to encourage him. Now we come to chapter 7, and notice this. There are 32,000 that are assembled now under Gideon. And I'm reading verse 1 of chapter 7 of Judges. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, 
so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now, my friend, this is really something. I think that when Gideon looked out over the 32,000, he said to himself, I wish they were double that number. I wish I had more. This man Gideon felt like he needed more. And now God says to him, he says, you got too many. I can't let you have the victory with this many. Why? Because Israel would say, it was because of my power and my might. That's the reason, friends, no flesh is going to glory in God's presence. And that's the reason God has to take the weak instruments today. It's the reason he's always followed that method, and he still does it today, by the way. Now, this is the way he's going to cut down the number of the army. And this was a pretty good way of cutting it down. Verse 3, Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. So that you see there were thirty-two thousand in all, but he lost twenty-two thousand. And you remember this was God's condition had been put down in the Mosaic system. We saw it back in the book of Deuteronomy that God says that there will be this excuse for those that are drafted into the army if they be able to just be able to say they were afraid. Now, the question always arisen in my mind, why didn't Gideon go home? Because if there was anybody there afraid, he was afraid. I know two fellows that would have gone home had they been there. One's McGee and the other's Gideon, but he's the leader. And I think he's frightened when he got it cut out now to 10,000. And that's not enough. Will you notice what happens now? And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Now, again, God says, even when it's reduced from 32,000 to 10,000, he says, this is too many. And I'm of the opinion at this particular time, Gideon is certainly ready to go home. But he says, now I'm going to try them. They go down to the water. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, everyone that lappeth up the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lap, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Now, this is a tremendous statement that we have here. Three hundred lap water like a dog. These were dedicated men. You see, when they walked into the water, why, they just took their hands and pushed it up to their mouths and kept moving. And they said, let's get to the Midianites. Let's win the victory. God will deliver us. And then there were quite a crowd there, you see, 10,000 that went in, only 300 of them, lap water like a dog, the 9,700. They got down on all fours. They took a drink and they said, oh, my, isn't this terrible to have to go to war like this. And do you know what you have here? The finest lesson in what is God's election and man's free will. Now, God chose 300 men. But how did he choose 300 men? By letting man use his free will. And had you gone down there and you'd been there, and you would have said to one of those 300, Say, did you know God has elected you? He said, I don't know what you're talking about, but we're sure going to go after these Midianites. That's the thing. You know, you can stand and argue election and free will all you want to. It works, but 
You can't make it work by sitting down and arguing. It works out in life, friends. God had chosen 300 men. But you'd ask one of those 300, they would have said, I know nothing about the election. I haven't time to argue with you about that. I got to get over here to get at these Midianites. Now, if you'd gone to one of the 9,700 down on all fours, and you'd have said to them, did you know you're not elected? And they'd whine and say, yes, I'm always left out. But you see, they made the decision. Each one of them exercised his free will. God didn't interfere with one of them as far as their free will is concerned. And you know, you can argue about election and free will today, but my friend, Jesus Christ has offered to you, and it's a legitimate offer. It's a sincere offer from God, and he says, "...whosoever will may come, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out." Now, don't tell me that you can stand on the corner and argue about election right now. You can't. You can come if you want to come. Now, listen, if you don't come, I have news for you. You weren't elected. If you do come, I have good news for you. You were elected. And that's the way God moves, so that the responsibility was upon these men, you see. And these men got down on their knees like this. Now, I've heard something else, and I know there are a lot of Gideons listening to me, and I'd like for them to listen now very carefully, and a lot of folk in churches. I went and preached to a little church. I was invited out. I already had a little church, and it was a wonderful little church. But they called me and asked me if I wouldn't go and preach at another church for a Sunday morning. And I got one of the students to seminary to take my church that Sunday, so I went way out in the woods in Georgia to preach. And I came to this church, and I never shall forget, there's a dear lady there met me. She's one of the leading saints. And she said, Oh, Brother McGee, we're so glad you come. But all that we have here is just a little Gideon's band. May I say to you, Oh, how wrong she was. They had the laziest bunch of saints that you can imagine. You know, Gideon's band, they just happened to be those that were on fire for God. They wanted to win a battle for God. They wanted to serve God. And that wasn't true in that little church. A great many people think because they're few in number, they happen to be a Gideon's band. The chances are they're a bunch of dead saints that don't compare to Gideon's ban in any way that you want to look at them. Now, God's going to give this man Gideon his final lesson before he goes into battle. He says to him, and I'll drop down to verse 10, he says to him, But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phurah, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then when he down with Phurah, his servant, under the outside of the armed men that were in the host, and the Midianites, and the Amalekites, and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And here we got the grasshoppers again. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent and smote it, that it fell and overturned it, that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the hosts." And Gideon went down, you see, and eavesdropped. He went down at the edge of the camp, and he listened to these two soldiers talking. And they very frankly believe that God is going to deliver their hosts into the hands of Gideon. Now, God permitted him to hear that to encourage him. And I'm confident that it did encourage him. Now, we come to this here, and I think I can probably save a little time if I don't read too much of this. But at verse 16, now they're going to have the victory over Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand 
with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Now, that was at midnight. And they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets, break the pitchers that were in the hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets, break the pitchers, and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place, round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host fled to Beth Chitta in Zerirath, and to the border of Abel, Meholah, unto Tabath. Now, this is the record that's given here. And notice the strategy of Gideon. He takes the 300, puts them in three groups. They're given three things, pitchers, lamps, and trumpets. Now, the lamps are put down in the pitchers, and that means that the light went up so that they could not see it. You know, light, when it's put up at night into the sky, you don't see anything around you at all. And this was the thing they did. And then they took trumpets. And they talk about the trumpet of the Lord and the trumpet of Gideon. Fine. But the interesting thing is that they said it was the sword of Gideon. But there weren't any swords. Now, you will recall the Midianites were a nomadic people. This is something that the scholarly work of Bernie Musell breasted in Garstan. They all tell about the fact that at this time there were these nomadic tribes of the desert that began to raid the land of Israel and to seize the crops and their supplies. And the Midianites and Amalekites, they were among those Bedouins of the desert. Now, they had a very loose organization. They moved as a disorganized nomads through the desert. And they were not an organized army. So here they set guards around the camp, of course. But all the people are asleep. They're just sleeping here, there, and yon, and no organization whatsoever. And nobody expects anybody to attack at night. Begin with, you couldn't see. Now here comes Gideon, and he posts 100 of his men on this side, one on the other side, one around on the other. So these men, the thing they did, they blew with the trumpets, they broke the pitches, and the light shone out. And when they blew the trumpets, each trumpet would represent that there were probably several hundred of the enemy present. Well, imagine one of these Midianites waking out of a sound sleep. The first thing he did, he started whacking with his sword in every direction. Well, the Israelites don't have swords. All that they did was just hold the light so that one Midianite could go after another Midianite. And you talk about a riot it was a riot. And they took to the tall timber and they went over the hill. They got out of that area and this gave a tremendous victory to Gideon with just a few, you see. Now, there are some very wonderful lessons that are here. First of all, let me go back to this matter of the dew on the fleece. I want to look at that for just a moment. You know, the very interesting thing, we need God today to do an interior job of decorating inside our own lives. We need to ask him for dew on our barren lives. You remember he says, I will be as dew upon Israel. God has said that several times. And you will find that in Deuteronomy thirty three thirteen he says, And of Joseph he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath. 
And then in Proverbs 19, 12, the king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. And in Proverbs 3, 20, by his knowledge, the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. And then in Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. And that's the unity of the Spirit. By the way, the filling of the Spirit went down to the skirts of his garment as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended from the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And God has blessed in that way. And we need that touch. We need a fresh touch. We need the fresh touch like dew upon the rose bud and the grass in the morning. And we need a tender touch. You remember in Hosea 14, verse 5, I will be as dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Well, the lily is delicate. And he'll come down like rain upon the mown grass. Even when we're in trouble and he's cut us down, he'll come down like rain. Our Lord could weep over Jerusalem, but do we weep today over sinners? The publican could smite his breast and cry out about his sin, but what about us today? We need a touch from God. We need a touch from God that'll make us stable and strong and rooted and built up and grounded and settled, as Paul said to the Colossians. And the psalmist said in Psalm 57, 7, My heart is fixed. Oh, God, my heart is fixed. And Paul could say from henceforth, Let no man touch me. And friends, we need today the dew of God upon our lives to bring purity into our lives. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. We need that today. God only uses a clean cup. He says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And there, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. What a wonderful picture that you have there. But may I say, let's carry through on something else that is here. And this is a wonderful lesson, by the way. We are told today that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're just like those pictures today. And some of us you know, are not broken, and as a result, the light doesn't shine through. And again, Paul said, let no man glory in man. It's not our light that should shine, but the light of Jesus Christ should shine through us, and it can only shine in a broken light. Ye shine as lights in the world, Paul said to the Philippians. And then if the trumpet give an uncertain sound... Oh, I tell you, we need to be clear and clean today in our living, friends. What a message is here, a spiritual message in the story of Gideon, the man that God used. And he was a coward, but God used him. God chooses the weak things of this world, friends. And it's an encouragement to me. I hope it's an encouragement to you. Now, friends, we come to the eighth chapter of the book of Judges today. You have your Bible, and it'll turn there. And if you have our notes and outlines, just follow along, and you'll find it'll make this passage more meaningful to you, especially if you read it beforehand. Now, here in the eighth chapter, we have a continuance of the record of this man Gideon, who was the judge. And you will notice that we have more concerning Gideon than any other judge. This man, Gideon, we began with him actually in chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And then, of course, in chapter 9, we have the story of his son. There's a question whether he was a judge or not. But we have this rather extended section here. 
and we'll be, of course, taking that up now. Here in the eighth chapter, you find that these are the events that came to pass after this remarkable deliverance that God gave through Gideon over the Midianites. And now the children of Israel again are free, and as a result, why, they are prosperous, they're being blessed, and they were so grateful to Gideon for what he had done that they then ask him, and I'm going to drop all the way down to verse 22 of chapter 8 of Judges, and I'm reading, "...then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian." Now, this is the very first time that we've been given the inclination of the people of Israel in wanting a king to rule over them. God told them at the beginning he did not want them to have a king like the nations round about them. But they began to want a king like the nations round about them. And because Gideon had delivered them, they asked him now to accept that position. Now, he's the first one that apparently it's been offered to, and he turned it down. And later on, we'll find out that they'll ask for a king again, and they become insistent upon it. They demand the king. And God tells Samuel that he's to anoint a king for them. And he says to Samuel, who is actually the last of the judges, the first of the prophets, that is, of the order of prophets. And God told Samuel, he said, they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. You see, God wanted to rule over them. And in this case, why, it was God that had used Gideon so remarkably. But now the men of Israel, they want Gideon to rule over them. And not only Gideon, but his son and his son's sons, which means they want a king like the other nations that are round about them. And this, of course, gave an idea, it put a thought in the mind of Gideon's son that we'll see in just a few moments and probably was the very basis of his conspiracy and his attempt to become actually the king over these people. Now, I want you to notice the remarkable answer that Gideon gave. And this is remarkable, verse 23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now, this man Gideon has certainly learned the lesson. There's no question about that. He recognized this boy that was... There he was thrashing grain down by the wine press, the coward that he was. And Gideon knew that God had given the victory and that it was not in him, but God had raised him up for this purpose and that the order was a theocracy, that is, that God wanted to rule directly over these people. And so he says, I'm not going to rule over you and my son will not rule over you. And the Lord is the one that shall rule over you. Now, Gideon is therefore a very remarkable person. And you'll find that when in the chapter in Hebrews, of the we call them heroes of faith, but it's what faith did in the lives of men in the past under all ages and conditions, And we find here in verse 32 of Hebrews 11, And what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon? And he leads the list here of all the judges. In fact, the matter is, he's put in the head of the list of David. Of course, he comes chronologically before David. I've always marveled that David was given such a small a space in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, but the explanation is that the writer says, the time had failed me, and he wanted to tell about Gideon. Well, the story is recorded back here, and it's a remarkable story. This man, Gideon, 
raised up. God chooses the weak things of the world. And that's his method today, friends. Any man, a woman that God uses has to be used on God's terms, and this is his terms. He chooses the weak things of this world. Now, as I said at the beginning, most of us are too strong for God to use us and to lead us. Now, I wish we could close the record of Gideon at this particular spot, but you can't. And this is the black mark in his life. This is actually the basis of that which caused tragedy later on. All of these men had a glaring weakness. And most of the cases, God used that. And, of course, the weakness of this man, Gideon, was the fact that he was a coward, very frankly. I felt very close to this man, Gideon, myself and my ministry. When I went to become pastor in 1949 at the Church of the Open Door in downtown Los Angeles, my first message to the people was on Gideon. And I put myself in that class that I came in weakness and that the only reason I could see that God had called me was the fact that I was like Gideon. In that respect, I sure was weak and cowardly, by the way. And I have rejoiced in the fact that God did for me what he did for Gideon. He certainly was with me. And I've always been grateful to him. And I've discovered that when I get in the way and I do some time, why, then I stumble and fall. But as long as you're just willing to let God do it, it's remarkable what he'll do. And I give God all the glory for this radio ministry, friends. I never sought it. I, I didn't start out after it. It just like Topsy, it growed and God has blessed it. And I rejoice in it. He's been very wonderful. What a testimony. Now, I wish we could end here, but Gideon had another weakness. And here it is. Verse 30. And Gideon had Three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. He had seventy sons, friends, and he had many wives. Now, that's the blot on this man's life. And it's a real blot, because somebody's going to come along, as they say about Solomon. Oh, how could God use a man like this? And why would God take a man like this? Now, God didn't take Gideon, as we've seen, because of this. He did this afterward. And the fact of the matter is that God used him in spite of this. And God did not approve of this. The record has it here. And I think the record makes it clear that this brought tragedy into the nation, as we'll see here in the next chapter. And so this is a blot in the life of Gideon, God had forbidden them, forbidden them to intermarry outside. He had forbidden them to have more than one wife. And God didn't create a bunch of Eves for Adam. He only created one. He didn't take out all his ribs. He only took out one. fact of the matter is, God has never blessed that, beginning with Abraham. Abraham, you know, had another wife. That is, he took a concubine, that little Egyptian maid, Hagar, and believe me, it caused trouble. Friends, it's still causing trouble. I talked to an Arab guy down at Jericho that took me down there, and he was very proud of the fact. He says, I'm a son of Abraham. He's an Arab. And you know how? Through Ishmael. He was a Muslim, and he was very proud. He said, I'm a son of Abraham through Ishmael. That's true. That was the sin of Abraham. God never blessed that, friends. And God is not going to bless Gideon. And God didn't bless this man Solomon. In fact, the matter is it split the kingdom. And it's going to cause tragedy here. This is the blot in his life. Just because the record is given, God doesn't hide anything. God paints man's picture as he is. Now, if a friend who is his biographer had written this, he'd left this out, I'm sure. 
but not God. He paints mankind in all of his lurid, sinful colors. And this man, Gideon, this is the black mark against him. And we have here that he had a concubine that was in Shechem. She also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. Keep him before you, by the way. He actually had 71 sons. Now, verse 33, it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again, and they went a-whoring after Balaam, and made Baal bereath their God. Same old story, is it not? The hoop of history continues to roll as it's rolling today. You find them a nation serving God. Then what happens? They did evil. They forsook God. They turned to Baal. And God sells them into slavery and servitude. They cry out to God. They repented, and judges raised up and delivered them, and a nation serving God. But here they go again, that soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again, went a-whoring after Balaam. That is the sad, sordid story of that nation, and also actually of his church today. And it's true, I'm afraid, in the lives of nations... It's in the lives of churches. It's in the lives of individuals, this up-and-down business. Today, many of us are just rolling a hook through this world. One day we're up, the next day we're down. God never intended our spiritual life to be like that, by the way. Now we come to chapter 9, and I'm not going to have too much to say about chapter 9. Because we have the story of Abimelech, the sinful and wicked son of Gideon. You see, he shouldn't have had this concubine. I tell you, it caused trouble in the nation. And what kind of trouble did it occur? Well, this boy Abimelech is very ambitious. He's going to do an awful thing. And he's rated by some a judge. And by others, he's not rated a judge. And you'll note that in my outline that I've given, more or less, I guess you'd say I've taken a middle course, because in this fifth apostasy, there was civil war, and it was caused largely by Abimelech. And actually, this man Abimelech, along with Tola and Jair, they were the judges during this period. I don't think any of them did very much, but they're recorded as being the one during this time of internal trouble that was actually caused by Abimelech and the awful thing that he did. Now, we're told here that Gideon had 70 sons. And what did this boy Abimelech do? Well, we find here that the men of Shechem, because his mother was from that land, they follow this boy Abimelech. And he had heard the nation wanting Gideon to become their ruler and his son. And so this boy wanted to become a king. He's very ambitious. And the thing that he did, and I'm not reading all of this chapter. I trust you will. You'll find it very candidly, very profitable, because here's a lesson. This reveals the sin of man. And you find here that this man, Abimelech, is a very wicked person. And Dr. Gray wrote this concerning him. He says, The usurp rule of Abimelech, the fratricide, is not usually counted. That is, he's not counted as a judge. He did rule three years. And what was it he did? He slew the 70 sons of Gideon, and he made himself king. And his abortive reign reveals... I think the truth of Daniel 4, 17, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man, and he setteth up over it the basis of man. Now, when a good ruler comes along in the world, a great many people say, well, God raised him up. What about that wicked ruler? Well, God permits him to come to the throne. You know why? Because like priests, like people, is the principle here, and we find that these people, they got the kind of ruler they deserve. And they wanted this boy Abimelech to rule over him, and he ruled over them. And God sets over 
this world the basest of rulers. All you got to do, friends, look around in the world today. you find that's the way that it is. Now, we find here that God judges this man Abimelech for the awful thing that he did, and he also judges the man of Shechem for making him king and starting him out at this. And there was civil war, because there were many who didn't want him, of course. And I'll begin reading now at verse 52. And Abimelech came under the tower and fought against it, and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man his armor-bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me a woman slew him. (laughs) He didn't want that reputation. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the man of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed every man unto his place. Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech which he did unto his father in slaying his seventy brethren. And all the evil of the man of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. Now, this is the sad story and the sad ending, actually, of this man Gideon. After being such a remarkable ruler and lifted up, out from nothing, then to have this in his life that God could not approve of, did not approve of, and finally had to judge. Now, that actually brings us down to chapter 10. And you have given here now the judge that we put along with Abimelech. We have put in our outline, I'm sure that you've noticed that, that we had in this fifth apostasy in the civil war that was caused by Abimelech, and yet he apparently for two or three years delivered the people and brought a certain amount of peace to the land. But, of course, the civil war broke out, and he's put here with Tola and Jair. Now, we come in chapter 10 first to this man Tola. Maybe you've never heard of Tola, and if you haven't, It's perfectly all right. He never did anything. Notice this. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years. And what did he do? He died. He was buried in Shamir. Not one thing is recorded about what this man did. Friends, I want to say to you that this man was pretty much of a failure. Just think of it. There's not one thing that you can mention that this man did from the day he was born to the day he died. All you've got here is what's on his tombstone. Born, died. And I guess you could say he was judged. Well, this man Jair that we're coming to now, Jair, he's the eighth judge. Now, let me read. After him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. Now, what did he do? Well, he had thirty sons. They rode on thirty ass coats, and they had thirty cities, which are called Havoth Jair, unto this day, which in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Canaan. All that we're told about this man is that he had 30 sons, and he bought each one of them a little donkey. And, of course, that was the same as buying them a convertible in that day. And he didn't get them a Jaguar or a Mustang or a Pinto or a Cougar, and he didn't put a tiger in the tank either. But he gave each one of them a donkey. And I think the funniest sight, well, it was a show to see those 30 boys go riding out of Gilead every morning, what a sight this was. Now, this is the man that is before us. And in his story, I see three things. You have prosperity without purpose. 
You have affluence without influence, and you have prestige without power. Now, in that day, a donkey was a mark of prosperity, by the way. That was the thing that denoted a man's wealth. We are told in chapter 5, for instance, in the Song of Deborah, and there at verse 10, they speak of those that belong to the upper echelon, the establishment, and it says, "...speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way." So the little donkey in that day actually was a mark of wealth, and it was the animal that kings rode upon. Now, there's always been a question whether they had horses in that day. But in Scripture, the little donkey is the animal of peace, and the horse is the animal of war. And the horse was imported into that land. It was brought from elsewhere. But the little donkey was actually the mark of prosperity, and it was the mark of the king. You remember when the Lord Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem on a little donkey, we misinterpret what Zechariah meant when he said he's humble. He's not humble because he's riding on a little donkey. He's humble in spite of the fact that he's riding on an animal that only kings ride upon. It was really presumption if he were not the king to ride on a little donkey as he did into Jerusalem and receive all of the adulation from the crowd that day and hear the hosannas that were given out. Now, Jair was obviously a man of wealth and prominence to be able to have 30 donkeys. And he had 30 sons. And now he gives to each one of these boys a donkey. He had a 30-car garage. We think people are wealthy today that have a two-car, a three-car garage. But what about a 30-car garage? And he didn't give them just a jalopy. He didn't give them a little... Pinto or Mustang or... Well, I think maybe you could say that the donkey was the Volkswagen of that day. But actually, it would compare to a Triumph or Hillman or Simca or Volvo. And today, we put a tiger in the tank. But here, it was just these little donkeys. And this was a mark of a benevolent father. He was generous. I think it means he spoiled his sons. He got them what they wanted. They all wanted the latest thing. That was a donkey. And they lived in the lap of luxury and the golden spoons in the mountain. And to what purpose did these donkeys contribute? Of course, they come in several models. You know, the donkey has his long ears up. Well, sometimes he puts them down. So they had a convertible. You could have the ears up or have the ears down, top up or top down. And it was the latest thing. But did these donkeys bring glory to God? Did they make Jair a better judge? Did they bring blessing to the people? Did any one of these boys go as a missionary? No, they lived in Gilead. And you remember the psalmist says, there's no bomb in Gilead. <laughs> but there was the braying of the donkeys at this time. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong, friends, with donkeys that's true, but there's nothing particularly right with a man who's judge, and he had spent a whole lot of time with 30 boys with 30 donkeys. And that is something that is very important to see. Now, our Lord rode into Jerusalem on a little donkey to fulfill prophecy and to present himself as king. And the Hosannas were sung, and Satan was angry, and the religious rulers protested. But all 30 of these donkeys never lifted one hosanna, only the braying of these 30 animals. And I think Satan smiled, and the mob was entertained. You have here prosperity without purpose, friends, is a dangerous thing. In the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. Solomon sent out ships to bring back apes and peacocks. Peacocks for beauty, apes for entertainment. He was going to put on a real pageant. Way back, many years ago, a high school up in Washington, I think it was, 
came up with this motto for their graduating class. Pep without purpose is piffle. Well, it's not much of a motto, but it sure expresses this generation. And today we have prosperity, but without purpose. And may I ask, what's the goal of your life? Is it pointless, aimless? Have you found life pretty boring? Hamlet, you remember, Shakespeare has him say, How stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me the uses of this world. And many years ago in England, there was an angry young man. And I understand all those angry young men are now members of the establishment. We need today direction. We need a new dimension to life. We need a cause today. And the cause of Jesus Christ is still the biggest challenge any man can have. Oh, Jair was some judge, wasn't he? And then you have here prestige without power. He was the outstanding man in the community. I don't think the traffic cops ever gave his sons a ticket. And here it says in verse 5, And Jair died and was buried in Camon. There's no monument there. It's an unknown spot. He never performed one conspicuous act. He never did a worthwhile deed. He never gained a victory. He had 30 donkey power, no horsepower at all, and no spiritual power. You and I are living in a day when the church has lost its power, its spiritual power. What a picture you have here in this man. Many years ago, here in Pasadena in a rose parade, it was right before World War II, by the way, and I think it was the last parade. And the Standard Oil Company float was a beautiful thing, all covered with American Beauty roses. Oh, how lovely it was. And the theme that year of the parade was be prepared. Is right before we entered World War II. Be prepared. My, what a tremendous motto that was. And right in the middle of the parade, the Standard Oil Company float ran out of gas. You know, I couldn't help but just sit there and laugh because it happened right along where I was standing, and I couldn't help but laugh. There was one float in that parade that should not have run out of gas. It was this float, by the way. They should have had plenty of gas. And I thought as I looked at that beautiful float, that's the picture of a great many Christians today. They have no power in their lives. Beauty, prestige without power. What a picture that is. That's Jair for you. Now let's move on down, and we come now to the bringing in of Jephthah as the ninth judge. And at verse 6 I read, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. You would think that after all these experiences that these people would learn that when they turned to idolatry, trouble came upon them, and they actually went into slavery again. You would think that they would be true and serve God. But you know, human nature is fallen human nature. The heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah says. Who can know it? You and I do not know. And it's easy for us to point our finger way back to these people a thousand years and more before Christ and said, say, you did it wrong. How are we doing today, by the way? May I say there's a frightful apostasy today in the church. Human nature's like that. And we're in a nation that's in trouble. And yet we tried every kind of a method and every political scheme and every political party. We tried them all. Don't work. What's wrong? Well, we've gone to the wrong place. Only God today. Only turning to God and I know that sounds square. That sounds so out of date. But it sounded out of date, friends, even a thousand years before Christ. These people turned to all these gods. 
And we read here, verse 7, "...the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon." Now, God can afford to remove his instrument when that instrument fails him. A great many people think today that God has to have the church and that God has to have a particular church and that God has to have this nation because we're sending out missionaries. May I say to you, God doesn't have to have any of us. He's not dependent on us at all, but we are dependent on him. Now, these people went, I think at this time, probably to the lowest point that they ever went to. And we read in verse 10, "...and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we've forsaken our God and also served Balaam." Finally, they got so desperate, they turned to God. And this is the same old story that we see reenacted here. It's the hoop of history that's rolling, still rolling today. Now, what happened? And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, I'm reading verse 11 of chapter 10 of Judges, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites and the Maonites did oppress you? And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your trouble, your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned, do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day." And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. How merciful and gracious God is. Now, will you notice what happened? Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, they lack leadership. And that's always characteristic of men or of a generation that is turned from God. A generation like ours, for instance. The thing that is characterized actually... Most of this century, and certainly the last 25 years, has been the lack of leadership in the world. There has not been that vital leadership that is needed. And that was the condition of these people at this time. Now, they're going to turn to a most unusual man, one under normal circumstances they had not turned to at all. And I want you to meet this man, and we'll see his exploits next time, and we're going to see whether he really offered his daughter upon the altar.